welcome to Let's Do the Science, the show that comments on depictions of science and technology in the media and news. Today, we'll explore topics from the latest episode of The Expanse. How difficult would visiting Earth be for people from Mars in the belt? What is the Drake Equation and why don't we see signs of alien life everywhere we look in the galaxy? We'll do a flyby of Jupiter's moon Selene and discuss planetary landings and the delicate art of leaving people alive near the landing pad. So careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode and get ready for high G burn. Let's do the science of the expanse, season two, episode nine. This episode opens with a sequence that really expresses how alien life on Earth would be for someone who spends their life out in the rest of the solar system. A landing ship from Mars drops straight down through the atmosphere. No aerodynamics whatsoever because Earth is one of the rare places where people might visit in a system that has an atmosphere at all. Besides the gas giants, the only objects in the solar system with any significant atmosphere are Earth, Venus, and Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. Mars, at less than 1% of the pressure of Earth, is the next thickest atmosphere in the solar system. So there would be very little reason for anyone to design their ships with aerodynamics in mind other than Earthers. As soon as the delegation from Mars lands, their hardships begin. They have to wear sun visors to avoid being blinded because the sunlight they're used to is less than half as intense on Mars as it is on Earth. Gravity, too, would make it incredibly difficult to move as Mars is only about one-third of the gravity of Earth. Each Martian marine claims with pride that they regularly train at 1G, but they would tire easily because just breathing would be more effort over time. Anyone who's owned a cat can tell you how tiring it can be to have a 10-pound cat laying in your chest for a while, and it really exhausts you after a while of just sitting there and breathing. It would be that on steroids for people who are used to living off of Earth, and they make reference to this in the series often. To show just how different Earth is from every other place people would encounter in the show, I laid out the major locations we've seen so far. Lighting them up next to each other, you can see just how big and massive Earth is compared to the other objects. Mars is an order of magnitude smaller than Earth at one-third the gravity and less than 1% of the atmospheric pressure. Ganymede and the Moon much smaller still than Mars at about one-sixth of the gravity. Ceres is several orders of magnitude smaller than the Moon, with negligible gravity of its own. The asteroid Eros, where the protomolecule took over, is so small that you can't even see it in comparison to the other bodies, and we have to zoom way in to just see it dwarfed by the Moon right here. For people living off of Earth, fractional gravity is normal to them, and almost nobody has to consider the effects of an atmosphere. Even without the biome, Earth is truly unique and alien compared to life elsewhere in the solar system, and the show does a great job of reminding everyone of that at every opportunity. In fact, the difference in lifestyles is a major plot element that divides factions in the show and drives a lot of the political intrigue. Later on, there's an interesting exchange between two characters about the possibility of alien life in the universe and touches on three real key concepts. The Drake Equation, which they name, and some dialogue that touches on elements of two other major theories called the Fermi Paradox and the Great Filter. The Drake Equation itself was created by American astrophysicist Frank Drake in 1961 as a mathematical means to shape the scientific discussion around the possibility of intelligent alien life somewhere out there in the universe. And this was to recapture the topic from pop culture that had a more mythological bent than science, and really seriously discuss the possibility of this with other scientists. Simply stated, it tries to find the number of civilizations in our galaxy that communicate by multiplying the rate of star formation in the galaxy by the fraction that develops planets, by the fraction of planets that might be able to support life, by the fraction that might develop life, by the fraction that develops intelligent life, by the fraction that actually develops technology that can communicate, times the billions of years the galaxy has existed. 
People get a bit lost in the numbers and quote something like a few million civilizations in our galaxy alone and then argue about the number and how it's derived. In my opinion though, they're really missing the point Dr. Drake was trying to make. That equation only has two real possible results. It would be either zero or some significantly large number. Now without any other information, I would expect the number to be zero, but clearly that can't be the case because I'm sitting here talking to you about it. That brings us back to the core of it. That given a certain set of conditions, even vanishingly rare, the sheer size of the galaxy means that statistically, this would be expected to have happened many times over. So while we know that the answer cannot be zero, we can be fairly sure that the answer is almost certainly not one and exactly one. The characters then enter into an argument of what is basically the Fermi Paradox and the Great Filter. The Fermi Paradox was created by physicists Enrico Fermi and Michael Hart before the Drake Equation was formalized. It took the assertion that there were millions of civilizations out there in the galaxy, many of whom would be billions of years older than ours, and asked, well then where are they? If these civilizations were so numerous and had been broadcasting their signals everywhere for so long, then we should see signs of them everywhere we look. Instead, we get nothing. No signals, no signs, nothing. This has been ominously termed the Great Silence. In the 1990s, an economist named Robin Hansen tried to come up with a theory that explained the Fermi Paradox he called the Great Filter. This theory has softened and had been adapted to more generalized discussions of why the Great Silence. Those theories run the gamut from benign reasons like perhaps the time a civilization spends using radio waves before they move on to the next technology is very short, to more ominous ones like civilizations eventually wiping themselves out through any number of possible reasons like war or environmental collapse. There are many arguments and counter-arguments around all of these theories, and I encourage you to check out a good book on the topic. The show did a great job this week of carrying out that complex discussion in a few character interactions. Okay, so what I'd like now is to hear from you on this topic. I'd love to know what you think about it. If life can arise given a set of conditions, how likely do you think it is to have happened? If intelligent life is part of that, why do you think we don't see signs of them? And what is your take on the Great Silence and the Great Filter theories? In particular, any evidence for why you think that would be really interesting to hear, so post your theory in the comments using the hashtag MyTheory, and I'd love to see that discussion evolve. Later in the episode, we see the Rosinante breaking off to go hide behind one of Jupiter's moons, Selene. I love this short sequence because the show is expressing quite a bit of information in just a few short frames. The inward facing shot frames it against Jupiter to let you know where it is relative to other locations in the show. The outward facing shot frames some of the other moons in the background to let you know it's part of a cluster. And framed against the Rosinante, it gives you a sense of its size at a little over two kilometers across. Selene is a very small moon of Jupiter, only discovered in 2003, and thought to have been part of a larger body that broke apart. We'll have to pull it way out just to see it because it orbits Jupiter at about a hundred times the distance of our moon from Earth, and it takes a bit over two years to complete an orbit. From this distance, Jupiter would be barely visible as a planet, so the frame with Jupiter large in the background is about letting the audience know where they are. Although you really wouldn't be able to see the other small moons in similar orbit, it does come relatively close with a few of its sister moons at some point. The show is trying to communicate that by showing them in the same frame together. I really love how they set those shots up because, while they're not technically accurate to what you would see, it's more important to set the stage for the viewer. The impressive part for me is that they don't get lazy with their narrative here they still manage to fit in some interesting details about the location that manages to communicate something powerful about the complex beauty of the solar system to the viewer. I also love the shot of the Rosinante floating over Selene because it gives a scale we can kind of carry through to all the other locations we've been talking about so far. 
Cutting back to the shot of the system objects I used before, you can't see it, but Celine would be all the way over there on the end. Taking a while to zoom way in, you pass the smaller bodies and eventually get back to that tiny rock Eos to see that Celine is even smaller than that. I love this sense of scale, and it's worth noting that we're still only talking about the smaller bodies in the solar system. Trying to bring in the gas giants of the sun would just make it almost impossible to compare. Near the end of the show, we see a ship descending toward Ganymede, and what caught my eye was the fact that it's using the main drive cone for descent. I plan on doing an episode about the Epstein drive in the future after the season is wrapped up, so I won't go into too much detail now. The part that seemed interesting to me, though, is that it implies that whatever drive exhaust happens here isn't highly radioactive. We don't know much about it, but the implication is that the Epstein drive is a fusion reactor that has some highly efficient component setting it apart. Again, that is a topic for another show, but given the scene here, it implies the product of the exhaust isn't radioactive, or at least not significantly. That makes it highly unlikely that this is direct exhaust from the reactor, both due to the amounts of radiation it would produce and the heat of the plasma that would come out of it. So it implies there's some kind of alternative propellant than just the reaction mass. It could even be that they switch to superheated water on descent like this, or go tea kettle as they call it in the books. Particularly given the abundance of water on places like Ganymede, this could be a distinct possibility. If it's used as fuel for landings or when close to a station, it could even explain why water seems so rare out on places like Ceres, which is actually covered in water as far as we can tell from recent scans. It's a tantalizing clue to how the Epstein Drive might work, so I thought it would be worth noting. Likely it's just a narrative choice, but one of the things The Expanse does so well is it presents things in a way that doesn't usually break the science behind it, even if it's glossing over it for narrative purposes. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button, and for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get pop-ups when I post a new show each week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button below to tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today, what you enjoyed, if we left something out, or you have something to add. If you've gotten this far in the show, use the hashtag Celine, and we'll know you got all the way to the end. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there if you'd like. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week, and as always, stay curious.